You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network. Network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you. Of the listener, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the aforementioned Options Insider Radio Network. We sound a little bit different, coming to you live uh, croquet court side here at the FIA Boca Resort <laughs> Conference here. And uh, we are joined by yet another newcomer to the network. He is John Dieters, the Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Multi-Asset Solutions over there at the CFO. That's a hard thing to say five times fast there, John. I don't, it is, I don't it envy is. you. Welcome, it is. Welcome Happy to, to be program. here despite the title. <laughs> so, John, let's start off with all of our newcomers to the network. Why don't you go ahead and give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background and how you found your way over there to CFO. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, my background is in all things exchanges, but, it, but uh, I wound my way through a number of different parts of the business. I started out as a lawyer and did um, corporate M&A, worked with a lot of exchanges in that process and brokers. And that was early in the days of, of exchange consolidation, so it was a fascinating way to learn about the business. From there, I, I made my way into investment banking and worked in an advisory capacity with a number of global exchanges and banks. Taking my work one step further then, I joined SIBO, went in-house, if you will, about five years ago now. And um, that has obviously been quite a, quite a ride. A lot of transition and change, all for the better, has happened at SIBO since then. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer and, like you said, Head of Multi-Asset Solutions. What that is, in a, just a quick nutshell, Multi-Asset Solutions encompasses uh, many, of the, uh, many of the product support functions, so our research group, our product development group, that reports up through Multi-Asset Solutions, as well as our, think about our, our kind of non-matching engine technologies, many of which support the matching engines, but they, they lie outside of the regulated matching engine uh, framework. That, that sits in multi-asset solutions too. We're really trying to create this comprehensive sort of support structure that crosses asset classes and crosses geographies now that we're a big global exchange operator. Yeah, speaking of the big global exchange operator, it's hard to believe it's been about a year and a half since you guys announced yeah. uh, the past year, about a year since you closed it. I think it was last year this time right. that you actually closed it. So now we're looking back a year and a half. Uh, the wheels are pretty much in motion. Uh, how are things How are things progressed? Uh, like, as you expected, are you ahead of schedule, behind? How are things unfolding there with the integration and all of those things? It's really gone well. You, a lot of things you learn in a process like this, and, and it never quite plays out the way you expect it to. You have ideas about how the two companies will come together and the, 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 how the strengths will, will complement each other. I think I've learned a lot about cash equities and about ETPs and ETP listings and the growth of that business, potential of that business since we closed. It provides a tremendous real new upside, not to mention product ideas for us as a, as a company. And, and then there's FX, which is an entirely new asset class for us as Legacy SIBO, we weren't in that business, and now we're in it in a big way through the BATS combination. So a lot of fun new angles. I can't, um, I can't neglect to mention the fact that we went in Europe, for example, from one person a year and a half ago to 80-something today. So our presence globally, our ability to touch customers and teach them about volatility and options, the things that we had done at SIBO, but hadn't had that presence in, in Europe, it's just a fantastic new, new element to our business. So 
Everything going going really well. Um, like you said, they're only a year in, so um, so we've got a lot more work to do, and you'll see interesting things coming from SIBO Global Markets going forward. I'm glad you brought up the European angle because I've heard different things over the year change of what was what was the main driver for the deal. Was it tech? Was it like you mentioned the European exposure? Was it ETFs? Some, you, obviously, this was very much in your wheelhouse. If you had to list one primary thing that really attracted you guys to bats in the early days, which which or was it something else maybe that really really drew your attention over there i would i would rarely do a deal for one thing so it would have pick, to be an awfully one. good one. <laughs> acquired by law it would have to be an awfully good company and awfully good at that one thing if they did one thing and that were the only rationale but it, look if i you know if i if, if required by law i could start somewhere and i i certainly would say the 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 way that bats had oriented their strategy around Technology. I really would start with technology. If I had to, if I had to pick one thing, I, I'd, I'd say this team under Chris Isaacson really just does a fantastic job. They're almost sui generis, I think, in the exchange base. And there are good technology operators in the exchange base. There's no doubt about it. But, but the the efficiency with which the team operates, the speed with which they iterate through their technology and 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 perform new releases, the dependability, and that's just not not just from an uptime uptime point of view, but it, it's also from a from a consistency of speed, time of view, uh, point of view, all of those things are really kind of it sets sets a bat, bats technology team apart. And obviously, we're migrating all of our platforms, exchange platforms, over to bats technology. The most recent, the first great example of that has been our futures exchange CFE. We migrated that at the end of February, on time, without a hiccup, and it, that's a fantastic first uh, first win on the board. We'll look to migrate the others. The next one will be C2 in May of this year. That's our smaller options exchange. And then the larger SIBO options exchange, sometimes we call it C1, sometimes we just call it SIBO. Uh, we'll be announcing the date for that migration later in, in I saw in, May in the packet this morning. I was surprised. I said, oh, it could be done by May, but yeah, that's just no, C2. Yeah, no, that's okay. a real, that's was, a real that, monster. That, was, that seemed accelerated, but uh, That's hey. a real monster, but we're, <laughs> ha we're excited about what we can do there. And John, you, you can admit it. It was really spikes that brought you to bats. I know that. Uh, you know, it's just you and I talking here. We, and, exactly. Uh, yeah, between That between was the big driver. We know it. Between, <laughs> well, that's a flat, you know, um, uh, you, know uh, um, uh, you know, if you mimicry is the best form of flattery, and so... Um, what we what we learned from that is that we knew the bats guys knew we were onto something good through VIX. So there was a cultural alignment there, even though we make fun of spikes. Speaking of VIX, obviously a lot of headlines around that space uh, of late. Uh, some of them interesting. Uh, you know, there's of course was the big study a few months ago that came out alleging. Uh, you know, the manipulation in the puts. Now we see was the first, I think, um, lawsuit, at least that I've seen, alleging that. What are your thoughts over there at SIBO about this, about the, obviously you can't comment on, you know, too much about the litigation, but still, what are your thoughts on just the, the continued swirling rumors about the big space these days? Well, it's, it, you know, the first takeaway from it, from my point of view, is that it's just a, VIX has grown up a bit, but it's still a very young product. At 10 years, and we like to think about volatility as an asset class. So if you think about it in those terms, you know, you've, you've got grains that have been around for over a century, and equities that have been around forever, and, and, you, and commodities, other commodities are newer to the game, but not as new as 10 years. And so there are a lot of things that the market is learning about trading volatility in the form of a, of a, a package, a, a, an efficient package like VIX. And the market moves of end of Feb, uh, actually going all the way back to the beginning of Feb, have really been opportunities for us to further educate people on how these things work. I think there's also a natural selection involved here where certain early stage products get weeded out and designs get better and people gain confidence through that process and we'll see that happen here as well. So we're not, we're not afraid of any of these conversations, we embrace them. And you know, when it comes to questions like suitability and, and our, our all volatility related products being sold to the right end user, we're, uh, we're super, super focused on making sure that our, to the extent that we have a role and a voice in it, making sure that our, the partners in the VIX ecosystem are selling these products correctly. We're obviously super focused on making sure that the VIX marketplace, whether that's the, the actual trading of VIX products or it's the settlement process, that th those processes are run in the most transparent 
and most well supervised manner they could possibly be. I think it's safe to say these are some of the most highly supervised processes in the global equities marketplace, and we pride ourselves on that. So we, we take any kind of allegations like this seriously, but I can assure your listener base, Mark, that one thing we don't do is ever fall asleep on this market. So, so we, we are always, always conscientious about the, the markets being operated. Maybe you can clarify something for me, too, because a lot of the reporting around this issue has uh, has mentioned some sort of special FINRA investigation into this issue. I know you guys already outsourced a lot of your regulatory oversight to FINRA. Is that happening? Is there, is there a special, like, separate FINRA investigation, or is it kind of more just the regular ongoing oversight that they're doing? Yeah, we, we can't comment on anything specific that, that's going on from a regulatory or investigative standpoint. I think the journal standpoint. and a few others have, have highlighted this on special investigation. Yeah, this. yeah the, what, what I can say about that is that the, 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 the way that any processes that might be going on have been characterized but by and large, it's incorrect. So you don't see people, you know, whether it's FINRA or the SEC or the CFTC um, behaving reactively. So they have been very aware and very engaged in our markets since the inception. And FINRA, we, like you said, we, we pay them. They are our outsourced regulatory provider. And so we want them to be looking at our markets and making sure that the, the patterns they see are all legitimate. That's something that they've always done. So, so any kind of, kind of special new investigation as a reaction to recent events, we don't, from where we sit, we don't see that. You know, and I know, you know, John, on that subject, I kind of half jokingly mentioned this morning at your briefing. Uh, you do have the VXO; it's there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the concern, to, you know, to put it mildly, it seems to be around the skew portion of VIX. So you do have VXO. It seems like a lot of the people who are trying to replicate new VIXs now out there are removing that skew component. So it seems like they think there's a demand. Maybe, maybe one of their one of the market-based solutions to this is, you know, bring back VXO on the SPX, you know, and not have the SKU component. So if someone is out there, they are concerned about these issues, there you go, straight front month implied and that's it. Have you guys thought about that? Or do you think there's some nascent demand for that out there? Or Well, we don't, we started there. And, yeah. and, and we've evolved away from it for reasons that really were very, very, very concrete, very specific feedback from the market maker community to start with, and then feedback from the institutional community that wanted volatility look that really crossed the the range of the range of moneyness because where you put on a trade today if you're in a VIX derivative that lasts 30 days that trade is going to be in a different place in 30 days even in quiet markets that's going to be in a different place so a volatility product that prices at the money while at the money moves as we know it does it's just not a satisfactory product so we've engineered something better. We're not going back. Um, we, what we do, if, if, if there's any kind of reaction or there's any incremental engineering, like I, like I described, we view it as an evolutionary process. We'll take feedback and we will adjust and adapt the current VIX construct, but we're not gonna go back. And things we've done over the past that kind of, that reflect that adjustment, not just moving away from VXO to a broad skew-based volatility measure, include uh, adding in weeklies mm -hmm. to, to the calculation so that people get a kind of a, 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 a smoother um, view of, of volatility across expiration. So we're always open to adaptation and evolution. That's part of the game here in volatility. VXO with the weekly, some sort of hybrid VXO2, something like that, but not the new one. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There yeah, we go. That's where you I are. Did, I, did all your product, direction. I did all your product research for you. You're done. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, Thank you're you. welcome. You're welcome. My invoice will be in the mail. Okay. Uh, you mentioned before uh, suitability. That's an interesting topic as well because I know we've seen a lot of uh, interest in and debate about the inverse vol space these days, and that question uh, of suitability uh, comes up a lot. I'm curious, you know, where you fall on that. We've seen a wide array of opinion on this space post XIV implosion, post SVXY 
I guess you can say deleveraging, for lack of a better term. Uh, a lot of people up in arms on all sides of the fence. Some people saying, you know, these products never should have been approved. Others saying, you know, the brokers kind of fell down in terms of really gating who's trading these things. Others say, you know, the products worked as, as advertised and people just didn't know what the heck they were getting into. Uh, I'm curious, you know, looking back at this complex of the last month and a half, where do you think the failings were? And maybe do you think the opposite? Maybe you think it all functioned as it was supposed to and people just maybe got in over their heads. Yeah, and I don't know if we know yet because I think as people sort of explore and, and, and analyze what's occurred over the last couple months, I think questions about who sold which products and, and to whom, those, those questions in particular will, will be evaluated and we welcome that. If, you, if, 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 we, if it's determined that products were sold without, part of your question, the, the, the elements of your question are connected to each other, and there's a question about sort of education embedded in there too. So suitability and education we think go hand in hand. Someone who is not informed of a product or educated on a product is almost by definition not suitable. And so we, we want to make sure that the education effort gets, gets blended in together with, with the sales effort in the proper way. And, and I think we'll, that'll be determined. Now, when it, comes to, when it comes to the, the exchange's obligations, we, we, take our, we take education as almost an obligation, even though it's not a formal obligation from a legal point of view. And it's really in support of our partners who will be distributing our products. So we want to help them be able to educate and provide, you know, basis for suitability. But, um, you know, we think that volatility is a, whether or not it's traded in a VIX, uh, VIX framework, volatility is a, an important part of trading equities, any asset class for that matter, because you've got exposure to it whether you know it or not. And so that's the, that's the key way that market participants should look at VIX and its suitability is that you've got exposure, whether you know it or not. Well, whatever kind of investor you are, if you're in equities, you've got exposure. And so we need to make sure people understand how VIX products should be used, but we're, we're interested in seeing them used in a way that helps people mitigate the risks they have in their book today. Some people have talked about, because you need obviously level three clearance to go out and write options and things like that. Maybe something along those lines for these products as well, because they are holding a lot of, especially in the inverse space, a lot of short exposure, or maybe some sort of clearance or approval level for that, for people can just jump in and buy, let's say, whatever the next iteration of XIV is. It's something to consider. We're never going to be big advocates of throwing a lot of procedural and administrative hurdles in front of people to trade. So. We actually, and, and you know, this kind of goes back to our conversation on bats. We, we've got a great appreciation for how the ETP ecosystem has really democratized trading for a lot of different strategies. What I think we prefer to see happen is that re really people follow their kind of compliance obligations. It's kind of more that, a compliance obligations to, to educate their customer, make sure their customer is suitable um, before we start to entertain new administrative barriers. But maybe that's something that, that, that can be considered in the mix. Uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, all things crypto. It's nice. Actually, crypto has <laughs> kind of fallen off the radar a little bit over the last month. Things like volatility have come back to the fore. Yeah. So that's been kind of nice for me. Take a little bit of a break, but I, I'd have to ask you if they'll be really old. We talked back in January uh, at your briefing then about the potential for options coming. You said you wanted to get a few uh, settlements under your belt on the futures. You know, we've got a few settlements under our belt now. Uh, we also, you said you wanted to see how the technology migration is progressing. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the main exchange still has a little bit of a ways to go, but is there any more uh, timeline you can give us on, uh, on options, do you think, by the end of the year at least, or, you know, or longer? We don't have a firm timeline on it. I can say we're, we're excited about the possibility because you know, it's not just you asking markets. It's a lot of people who think that that's uh, a leg of the, 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 the cryptocurrency trading environment that, that's just missing, and, and it could, a lot of people could benefit from it. We, we're evaluating, the best way to describe it is evaluating what the next step will be, and we can, we can take the next step across a number of different dimensions. So another one might be derivatives on other cryptocurrencies like Ether. Is that in the cards and should that be first versus options? So it's an evaluative process. 
That's why we don't have a time frame yet. But I vote for options, by the way. Just okay, just all right. That's one vote. <laughs> noted. Duly noted. Then our listeners can play, too, because they, they want the option. That's right. Uh, well, John, we like to leave our listeners with a little bit of hint, a little bit of a tease of what's coming down the pike. So you got anything up your sleeve you want to share? Just, just you and I talking here. What can we expect coming down the pike from Cebo in the next few months? Well, we're, uh, anything we haven't announced yet, um, I don't think I'm prepared to announce today, even though Boca is a great place just to do it. Just you and I talking. That's all, uh, <laughs> that's all there is. You, you Beautiful and me. sunshine. And the palm trees and the bocce balls. But, um, but what, I will, what I will remind people of is that we've, um, we, we've said that we'll be looking to launch sector index options in the near future. And so we think that's a really exciting one as markets really start to, you know, great evolution over the last, call it year or so, where as the, as the stock market's going to run up, people really start to now evaluate individual sectors and how different economic environments related to those sectors, whether, whether it's tax or whether it's tariffs, have differing impacts. So we want to offer products that allow people kind of dis, to, to trade the dis, distinct uh, economic prospects of each of those sectors. So we'll look to do that. And, and remember, I mean, that's not just one product. That's 10 products. So we're super excited about that one to come in the coming months. Well, I know you, someone had mentioned this morning, too, about uh, a one-year VIX. Is that officially in the works, or is that something you guys are just talking it's about? An evaluative, it's an evaluative project right now, but we think it's, it's, it's potentially got some real merit as a complement to the, the, the VIX VIX that we all know and love, and that's a 30-day product. So, so there's, a, there's potential for a a VIX that really represents a one-year rolling volatility exposure. It would be a little bit of a smoother type of product. It wouldn't have quite the, the peaks and valleys that's, you know, that has pros and cons, and we're evaluating that as a product. And so if we were to move forward, obviously more on that in the coming months, too. Well, John, I'm glad you can join us here in the, in the beautiful sunshine Thank of you, Mark. Boca. We look forward <laughs> to seeing how all this unfolds in the marketplace in the coming months. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.